Welcome, everyone. This is our season five finale. I am very happy to have a good friend of mine, Brian Karen. He is a renowned educator here on Long Island and in the New York area, a chess historian, a candidate master. Very happy to speak with him. And I have to say, I can't take credit for this episode. This was all Brian's idea as far as our main topic, which is chess clubs back then compared to now. A lot to talk about. Very interesting. So, Brian, welcome. Good to uh, have you on. Welcome. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, Neil, taking a little trip down the path. Down the past. Yeah, no, it, and now it's funny. In preparation for this, I was on the USCF website last night. So just to give everybody some context, because I think people will find this interesting. So I actually started playing chess in tournaments in 2000. Okay, I was 29, really 28. I was just shy of my 29th birthday. So I was 28, which of course for some people is like, oh wow, that's late. Other people are like, you know, I didn't start playing until later than that. But anyway, I was 28 going on 29. Right now, I'm 51 going on 52. We'll say 51 so I feel younger. But anyway, it's just funny. When I first started playing, my very first tournament was at the Manhattan chess club, which no longer exists, but it was the Manhattan chess club. And it was my very first tournament. I'm 28 going on 29. I played one game and lost. I lost to a kid and it devastated me. He's actually the, his dad's actually a well-known grandmaster. I won't mention any names, but I lost to this kid. He was being a little you know, I don't know. He was like slamming the pieces, things like that. Some of those behaviors that kids do. I mean, that was a long time ago. He's probably in his thirties now. I mean, this was 2000, but I played just one game just to give people some context of what it's like to be sort of an improver who jumps in late. I played one game and was rated 646, 646. And I played this one game. I was so devastated that I lost to a kid. I just dropped out. So very, very rocky start. Then my second tournament was here on Long Island at a club here. And I played five games in that tournament. So after six games total, the one game at the Manhattan Chess Club and the five games here in Nassau County on Long Island, my rating was, wait for it, 521. So yeah. So that was my rating after six six games, 521. And just to show people what you can do about what I'm going to say 16 years later, 17 years later, and that was with some breaks. That wasn't straight through. I ended up getting a peak of 1885. So it can be done. I mean, I'm technically not happy with that. I would have hoped it was higher. And of course, right now it's not 1885, just with deflation and other things. I'm probably 200 points, maybe even a little bit lower than that. I mean, I'm confident I'll get it back. I'm doing some crazy swings right now, but Just to show you it can be done, I started, I was 28, had a rating of 521, and then about, I don't know, 16, 17 years later, got it up to 1885. So very interesting. So I just thought I'd share that because I thought people might want to know some of the numbers. And my peak rating of 1885 was five years ago. So trying to get that back, um, I mean, I'm slipping back and forth, if I'm being honest, because I like to talk in, in real numbers. I'm not going to talk about my chess.com rapid rating, <laughs> which that's like all the rage now. Ooh, what's your chess.com rapid rating? No, but I mean, it's 1885. Now I'm bouncing like in the like mid to high 1600s to mid to high, you know, 1700s. I'm kind of bouncing back and forth on my way back to where I was, class A, but that's the deal. So Brian, maybe you could tell us a little bit about when you started, because I know you started a lot younger than I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want to spend too much time because I talked about it on prior podcasts, but um, because there's a lot of stories and stuff. But basically, um, I was like one of the first, I think, computer uh, kids because before, like, so this was uh, around 1985 when I started. And before then, really, the only way you got good was by reading chess books and going to a club and gaining experience. So most people would start out, you know, at, at a novice level and slowly work their way up. Um, in my case, I was working at Your Move Chess Computers. They're, they're still in Massapequa, they're called ICD. 
And um, I had been playing against the tabletop chess computers, which were just starting to get good back then. And even before that, I had bought a little chess computer. So um, by the time I entered the tournaments, I was already pretty experienced and good. I had been playing against, you know, computers for years. They weren't like the computers of today, but they were more than challenging enough for me because, you know, I started as a beginner. And um, so my first provisional rating was 1825. And I came in, I think I won, I, I won a tournament, like I won all the games, um, you know, the novice, the, the lower section tournament. And yeah, you know, people were looking at, you know, some people that were like amazed. I remember Tanya Kronich, who is like a sort of um, like one of the leaders in the local chess community and one of the top ranked female players, um, which was only around expert level back then. Nowadays, to be a top ranked female player, you'd be much stronger. But um I played her to a draw, and uh, this is maybe after I've been playing over the board for a couple months, and uh, she was talking to Mark Ritter, who's by far the best player. Mark was, like, really upset at her, like, not upset, upset, but he's like, what are you doing? You're drawing a beginner or something? And she said, hey, he played really well. So, But, of course, you know, it wasn't because of natural talent. It was just that I was using the computers, and back then that didn't happen. Now, you know, again, contrasting modern times with nowadays, you know, if someone comes in and is like playing like a master and had never played before, you know, I mean, or some people would be thinking he might be cheating, but they also would be saying, okay, not surprising. He's playing on chess.com, he's playing on LI chess, he's doing all this online training. So, so you, you really, nowadays the ratings aren't as significant as they used to be because you never know how strong someone is, uh, you know, they're, um, because they could do so much on their own other than over the board chess. And it, again, it was limited back in the 80s and, uh, to some extent, the 90s, to that you could do that. Yeah, and beginners basically entered the club back then as real beginners. Exactly, exactly. Right. So, and the other thing too, Brian, this is a point you brought up, experts and masters, like being a chess master or an expert rated 2000, it was a more significant title back mm -hmm. then, right? You wouldn't be able to play or watch them play you know except at a club like you couldn't there was no internet club where you could just watch them daily on a regular basis and i, I just I, I just think it's interesting because we sort of not that we don't put them on a pedestal now but it almost seemed like they almost congregated just with each other and class players would just talk to players at their own rating now there seems to be a mixture like there isn't this sort of pretentiousness anymore where I, as I felt like, you know, when I first started playing in tournaments in 2000, I felt like, you know, for me to walk up to a master and start talking, it was almost considered rude. I don't know. Did you, did you experience anything like that? I, I really didn't. Um, when, when I went to the club, it, so first off, again, on a local level, contrasting uh, now back then, back in Nassau in the 80s and the early 90s, was incredible it had i don't know maybe 20 masters a week there i mean you could go on and on roger Lafleur, dan yosenham ronald simpson mark ritter tony renna you know I, I could just keep naming them and um jonathan troy you know just all these masters and, and experts of course would come down and yeah as you said what happened was so back then to see someone who's a master or an expert was like um you know, as you said, as you were implied, it was kind of impressive. You're like, wow, that guy, you know, he's really good. Nowadays, it doesn't mean as much because people go online and they're used to watching not only GMs play online, but super GMs most of the time. So even if you're a GM, it's really not that impressive anymore. I mean, I wouldn't say it's not impressive, but people don't give it um, the respect that it probably deserves. I know I've heard in some other podcasts, GMs are saying they used to offer draws and worse positions and you know, their lower ranked players would be happy to accept. Now they just like, no, you know, and they, they play to win. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think the fact that now um, it's so common to watch uh, super GMs play that, um, you know, a GM and an expert doesn't mean as much as it did back then. And you also had, like, speaking of the best players, that is, now it seems like it's much more international, right? Because nearly all the best players back then were from Russia, or I guess, you know, what, before 91, I guess you'd call it the Soviet Union. But, right, it, it seemed that way. So I'm I just wondering if you have any thoughts on that, because it, it's just very, very interesting. I know now a lot of the young kids from India are doing very, very well 
and they're predicting that they're going to kind of take over as the super GMs. So just wondering what your take is on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Back then, you know, you were just, there, there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, all the top players were from the USSR. So you, you felt like when you were playing chess, um, I mean, you enjoyed it and stuff, but you were sort of doing something that they mostly do in the USSR. Um, you, you know, uh, but now, um, yeah, as you said, it's international. You know, if you go down the top list, I mean, obviously the best player is from Norway. I don't know. You know, Magnus Carlsen's like maybe the most talented player ever. But if he grew up in the pre-computer age, when he had to take on, you know, people like the Soviet Union, um, it would have been tough. Uh, you know, they say Bobby Fischer didn't have much help, but Fischer had some help. You know, there, there were strong players in the U.S. And uh, if, Nor- if Magnus Carlsen tried to beat the USSR in the 60s and 70s, it would have been much harder because it really, you know, there was Simon Agustins in Norway, his coach, and a couple other people. But for the most part, it was very hard to make it if you were coming from a country like Norway. You you wouldn't have anything. And the USSR, the main thing the USSR had was um, you were able to train against other strong players. Not just, well, train with them, but play them, most importantly. I think the single most important thing for a player in terms of improving is to play stronger players. And again, if you grew up in Norway, you know, to a lesser extent, because you're growing up in the U.S., uh, it was very hard to do that. Uh, in the USSR, they got to challenge each other and learn from each other. So, um, yeah, it, now it's like everything. And as you said, India's coming up, China's coming up. Uh, these are two countries that, you know, in the early 80s were like chess was nothing, you know. A man broke through in India in the, you know, in the late 80s. Uh, and um, China, you know, just... You know, they didn't really have any good players until they started, you know, the Chinese government started a whole plan to develop players, uh, you know, sort of um, like Russia, the USSR did at the, uh, you know, in, in after World War II or a little bit before. Um, so they, you know, then they got the women's world champion, uh, Zizhen, you know, and, uh, you know, just slowly but surely China kept gaining momentum. Until now, of course, the world chess champions, Ding Luren. And, um, yeah, so now when you play chess, it doesn't feel like you're doing something that, you know, just, you know, in Russia or USSR. Now it feels like you're just doing a real international game. And, uh, you know, also I want to mention, in the, uh, you know, before I forget, in the 80s, especially, maybe a little bit in the 90s, before Fisher made his comeback in 1992 or, or came out of retirement, there was the ghost of Fisher kind of hanging over everything in chess. So you have this feeling that there was this guy who might be way stronger than, you know, Karpov and Kasparov and anyone else just sitting there constantly working on his chess. And, um, you know, that was the mystery Fisher. There was a mystery to Fisher, you know, because he retired after winning the world championship more or less, you know, completely. And then, um, and then he made that comeback in 92 against Baski. And although he played pretty well, particularly considering how long he was retired, you could see he wasn't quite the same. You know, he's out of shape. And most importantly of all, before 92, even though people knew that, you know, he, uh, you know, there, it wasn't a secret that he had some crazy beliefs with Nazis and this and that, but it wasn't quite um, as well publicized or well known. And then he came back and he just seemed like, you know, this just detestable person. Um so, yeah, I would say one other difference between the 80s and nowadays is uh, Fisher. You know, he, he was looked as this legendary player, good for chess. Now he's kind of looked like, you know, of course, a great player, but, um, you know, kind of a crazy guy. One of the things also that's changed, just kind of bringing it back to the club scene a little bit, the postmortem seems oh, yeah. to have gone, like, by the wayside, just human annotations and... Brian, this comment you had made, just so everybody knows, like full disclosure, Brian had sent me a list of topics for us to kind of discuss. So I have to say, all these topics, which are great, are really Brian's idea. What's interesting is that the postmortem, it's just not the same because so many people, and I'm guilty of this too, it's like, let me just go home and check it on the computer. Why should I bother? But that the beauty of that, of the human postmortem has it's kind of been lost, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, that's a whole facet of chess that's changed with computers. There was a mystery to it. And it wasn't just, uh, I mean, a big part of it was the postmortem. 
you know, everyone would do postmortems. Um, and, you know, that's, you, you know, to get to the truth of the position back then, the only, you really couldn't do it completely, first of all, but the best you could hope to do was maybe hire a grandmaster, have a grandmaster help you analyze the position. You never really knew. And in a way that was good. I mean, there's bad points, obviously, to it, but there's also good points that, you know, there was that mystery. You could have real arguments. You know, one guy could say, you know, A3 is the best move here. And you could say, no, it's not. And you go back and forth and, the, you know, the position might be so deep that no one really knows. But that arguing with them, or maybe I should say debating, you know, it's not necessarily that you're mad at the guy. Um, that was, A, I think, good for improvement and also good, um, just very, made chess very interesting. And, yeah, definitely the postmortems, that's kind of gone by the wayside. What's the sense of uh, talking to my opponent when I'm just going to go home and immediately see what the right answer is? Um, so, yeah, I missed that part of chess. And also I was noticing this. I've recently been going through a lot of old um, chess magazines. And I noticed, I remember when I got into chess back in the 80s, it was really fun going through chess magazines. I'd read, I'd look at the diagrams and I'd try to figure out what's going on. And then I'd read the annotations and, um, and I really enjoyed that. And then I said, boy, I don't really enjoy it as much in the modern um, magazines as I used to. And, and I realized the reason is when I look at modern annotations, I know it's all been checked by the computer. Normally the annotations are much longer than someone who actually had to work out, you know, over the board, you know, on their own, since it's so easy now to come up with long annotations. And they're, they're not necessarily the person's, um, you know, human intuition or human explanation. He's just copying the computer. He might have, you know, if you get a good annotator, he might have, you know, he, he might come up with his own opinions. But instead, but, but eventually he's going to be looking at the computer and changing everything. Um, when I look at these old magazines from the 80s, it was fun because uh, it was sort of um, like another human talking to you, showing his creativity, showing what he thinks of the position. And you can also look at it, you know, more critically in the back of your mind. You don't know that, you know, a top computer is, you know, everything's going to be more or less perfect. You know, you're, you're like, OK, you know, he said Rick C1, but actually maybe, you know, this isn't right. And then you had the letters columns in, in magazines like Chess Life where people would write in and say, hey, this annotation was wrong and what about this? And and it was very interesting. Um, so, you know, I do miss that. On the other hand, clearly the computers, you know, everyone's so much stronger today because they're computers, you know, kids are getting much stronger, quicker. And that is because the annotations are, you know, so powerful and the computers are so powerful. So probably from an improvement point of view, it's good. But uh, from an enjoyment, sort of fun point of view, um, I do miss that mystery that, that there was with chess. Yeah. And you don't have adjournments really anymore oh, yeah. either. That That's another lost thing. Yeah, the adjournments. That, that's another big thing. I know um, Lev Albert wrote a column in Chess Life a couple of years ago saying, he thinks they should still have them. So I don't know. You know, I mean, you can argue either way. I personally, as a player, I don't mind it too much because I'm the type of player, if, if I had an adjournment, that would be, you know, I'm going to be looking at that position constantly the whole week. You know, it's uh, it would constantly be on my mind. So I do like when you finish a game, you really finish it. But um, it was a whole other aspect of the game, um, you know, adjournments and stuff. Yeah. And Another thing too that that's fascinating for me is the rise of the digital clock with time delay because I remember even when I started in 2000 they were just kind of you know like digital clocks were kind of just becoming a thing and a lot of my older opponents were like violently against them so I you know I used to say like you know what do you object to the accuracy the fact that you can see how much time exactly you have left like is that what you object to and it was more it was more stubbornness than anything else. Like that's human nature for a lot of people. They complain about something, but they have no idea why they're complaining about it. They're just, you know, used to something different. And I just remember I had a lot of fights with my opponents because of course, when the digital clocks first came out, they changed the USCF rule that they were the preferred standard. And that regardless of which color you had, if you had the digital clock, it would take precedence. I had a, a lot of my opponents fought against it, but of course I think the digital clocks with time delay are the greatest thing. And, and because what happens is the delay sort of gives the position on the board more integrity than the clock itself. But I mean, I did play with an analog a few times and it's just, 
you, you know, the time scrambles. And this was back when you had rule 14 H like insufficient losing chances. But I'm just wondering what your experiences were with the analog and then moving to the digital. It is huge. I have to say, if there's one thing I regret, you know, cause as, as you know, I, I really haven't played a lot. You know, I, most of my playing was done in the nineties. Um, and, and you know, a little bit of the, mostly the nineties really. And, uh, and the early 2000s, I, I just, once I started, um, you know, teaching chess and getting to that, most chess teachers, before I got into it, I'm like, why don't they play more often? Um, and I, I, you know, you try to play a little bit, but it's very hard because you're preparing for your lessons, you're doing your lessons, and then to have to go out and play, it's like, and also maybe prepare for playing, it's hard. But, um, but in any case, um, I am like, when I used to play, I don't know if you do, uh, we didn't play that much, but I was in, I'd always get into time pressure and really bad time pressure. And they didn't have the digitals, they had the analog. So I would be playing, you know, players, uh, you know, where I have to make like 20 moves in five minutes, you know, this would be common, you know, or, or something like that, some incredible, uh, I know you once mentioned to me, wow, you, you move really quickly in time pressure. I'm like, trust me, this has been developed. Um, you know, because uh, I don't know what it is, you know, logically, you look at it before the game and after the game, you're like, why did you spend so much time there, you know, but I just, there was something about it, some psychological thing, and I'd always be in massive time pressure, and um, and I'd have that analog clock, and, um, you know, what what could you do? You, you never knew for sure how much time you had, so, you know, now if, I, now if I'm in time pressure... I can see exactly how much time I have left. I have the delay, which is wonderful. If I had a delay, I mean, that would have helped me a lot. <laughs> you know, I, again, because I had, you know, sometimes I didn't even have, you know, five minutes for 20 minutes. Sometimes it was five minutes for the rest of the game, you know, in sudden death. And, you know, you, again, you don't have delay. I, I mean, if I had delay, that would have been, oh. But, um, so yeah, I, I immediately like digital clocks and I really kind of, that's the one regret I had. Maybe if I was uh, playing more often, especially when I was younger, with these uh, digital clocks, it definitely would have made things a lot easier for me. And I do remember the arguments. I remember an argument we had uh, recently deceased, um, not recently, a year or two, uh, Al Baruch, great, great guy, uh, great player. But Al was among the time management type people, I guess you call him. Harold Stenzel is a big proponent of this also, where they feel time management is a huge part of the game. And, um, oh, I can't stand those guys. I, I'm, I'm sorry. To, I, I'm sorry to jump in. Like the, the people who are against time, I'm going to do my like annoying person's voice. Like the people who are against time delay. Um, well, you know, there shouldn't be time delay because the clock is as much a part of the game as your chest. Now, oh, shut up. I, I can't stand that. Like, cause th that's just, they just want to use their, like, those people tend to be, they just enjoy sort of like tactical, like junk chess and, you know, everything is like, you know, max lange attack and all the, you know what I'm saying? It, I, I completely disagree because having time delay, it makes your own thought and the position itself and the strategy more important than the actual time of the game, you know, cause, cause I mean, I'm obviously yeah, you're preaching no. to the choir, you know, but because the thing is, you know, when people get into chess and, and when chess was created, it wasn't like, for time management, you know, time management is put in place so that, you know, a round will end at a certain time. So one can't just sit there for six hours. So that's, that's the reason we have clocks. So the fact that now we have a way, which by the way, you know, Fisher deserves some credit for too. Um, now that we have a way uh, not to have to worry about that is a nice thing. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you on that, but all right. You know, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but in the end, you know, digital's one. I mean, algebraic, which is just so obviously better than descriptive, that was a big argument. Chess players are just kind of very set in their ways uh, whenever you want to make any sort of change. I don't know how, yeah, it's funny you mention that. I always tease Jared Tavares about this because mm -hmm. he, he's a relatively young guy using descriptive notation, but I don't know how people keep descriptive notation. I don't know how they read that, like pawn to king's bishop four. Are you, are you like, really? I, I don't see... In other words, if algebraic notation didn't exist, but now that algebraic notation exists, I don't know why they would want to use descriptive. Like you said, I guess they're used to it. But I mean, I was, when I first started, e even back in 2000, I mean, I was reading some books that were still using descriptive. But once, you know, once algebraic became more mainstream, I was like, oh, this is great. It's like a grid. 
But I, that's just, I don't, that's unfathomable to me why someone would reject. But again, it all goes to stubbornness. It's, it's probably the same people who were against time delay who were also against that. I, I bet, I bet the people who use descriptive notation still try to push their analog clocks at the club. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. I, don't, I know that, um, you know, it actually started, uh, Philidor, I believe it was Philidor and Stama. You know, they came out among, you know, the first, like, um, chess books, you know, popular chess books. And Stama, you know, years ago, I, I, this was like 1700s, I think, um, he uh, he had, like, a sort of algebraic system. But because he wasn't as popular as Philidor, Philidor's system um, took play, and that sort of led to the descriptive. Um, but it, it's just, like, it's not – I used to say I can't really tell the difference between descriptive and algebraic when I'm actually going through a game. But, uh, you know, I haven't looked at descriptive in so long. And about a year ago, I was going through a, a game in descriptive. And I'm like, oh, you know, and it, it was kind of messing me up. So uh, I can't even say anymore that I barely know the difference. Although if there's a really good book that's in descriptive and I can't get an algebraic. I'll still, uh, you know, I'll still use that. Yeah. And when, when you were playing in the 80s, Brian, because you started, you know, much earlier than I did, much younger. They were mm-hmm. also doing the pairings by hand because... I use, yes. I mean, as with most TDs, I use pairing software. If I had to do this by hand, I don't think I would be a certified TD. I mean, tell me what that was like. I, I don't know if, if you actually ran tournaments yourself, but. Oh, no, definitely not. No, I, um, so I started, you know, um, I'm not sure when my first tournament exactly was. I, I got into chess, like 84, 85, but it, that's not when I played over the board chess. Uh, that was like a couple of years later, or uh, I don't know when I exactly first played an over the board game. So. I didn't see a lot of it, um, but, uh, or, and, you know, it was just, it was kind of there in the background. So to the extent that it existed, I didn't pay too much attention to it because I wasn't running tournaments back then. I just know, I remember Harold Stenzel would be doing it. I think he had like cards or something. Um, but, but um, yeah, I don't remember too much about it, but I'm like you as a TD, I can't imagine how complicated that would be uh, to have to do the hand pairings. I, I did have to do it. They have these TD tests where you have to, do a, a hand pairing and it's so complicated um nowadays as you know as a td it's just simple you know enter it in the computer no problem but um yeah i just remember it existed i don't remember too much about it because again i wasn't like asking harold questions and probably it was in some of my other tournaments they were doing it there too but i, I don't remember too much about it other than that they did it you know and it, it wasn't I, I didn't see it a lot because pretty when I really seriously got into tournaments, I, I played um, I played a lot of unrated chess events when I lived in Massachusetts because the TD there, uh, in the area that I live, wouldn't do rated events. And then really when I seriously got into chess was probably around over the board chess. Like really serious was like around 94, 95 when I moved back to New York. And by then, I, th- I think they were on the computer by then. One other thing I wanted to ask you, it seems back then there were a lot less speed chess or rapid chess events oh yeah it was like classical was really the thing obviously now speed chess is ubiquitous i mean it's everywhere that's all people want to do especially online because they're on their phone everybody when you ask what their rating is the rating they jump to is their speed rating and not to sound cynical most people quote their chess.com rapid rating because they're not happy with their classical uscf over the board rating right Mm -hmm. that that's the you know whenever somebody explains something there's always what they tell you and then what they don't tell you they'll tell you their chess.com rapid rating which you know who knows how they even got there that's a separate discussion you know the whole uh but anyway i mean i was listening to jesse cry the other day and I'm, i'm paraphrasing this a little bit but he was talking about a student of his who's rated 2000 that's legit. A student, his, his like chess.com rating is 2000, but he was saying in an online tournament, he played something like 50% of his opponents cheated or something. There, there, there was all, but that's just how the online speed chess scene is now. So, you know, the rapid ratings to me don't have too much integrity, but so that's what everybody tells you. They tell you their rapid rating. What they won't tell you is their USCF over the board rating, which is, what it's all about but tell me what it was like back then as far as like speed chess or the lack thereof yeah yeah uh, well a few things before i forget uh 
Yeah, I've noticed that too. People referring to their chess.com ratings or something as a real rating. I guess if you never played over the board, maybe it makes a little sense. But really, I can't take any reading seriously unless they're over the board. Because again, as you said, there could be cheating going on. Not necessarily that the person who's giving you the rating is cheating, but it affects the whole rating system. And then also, uh, you're playing under non-standard conditions. So, for example, when I play, I'm in my home completely alone in the room, focused on the game, and, uh, you know, that's how it is. Now, so, and also, as you said, my opponent might be having, like, five kids around him playing on his phone, you know? So when we play over the board, you both have the same conditions. So the yes. ratings are much better. Yeah. Brian, can I just jump in? I just want to clarify something for the listeners. So when I say I don't give the, like, chess.com rapid ratings integrity, I'm not, I'm not so much talking about the cheaters, but also... I, I think people's rapid ratings could be inflated because of exactly what Brian was talking about. And I've seen this with my own games where, you know, you're playing uh, someone who's normally a strong player, but like Brian said, because they're dealing with maybe little kids at home or they're multitasking or, you know, they're playing on their phone while doing 10 other things, they're going to hang a piece that they normally wouldn't in in-person conditions. And so you then win the game and get all those rating points but is it really because you were a better player and that it was a well thought out battle? No, it's because the person you were playing on the other end on his phone w wasn't really paying attention to the game. In other words, the chess.com rapid ratings, it affects the ratings of both the, the cheaters and the non-cheaters because even if your opponent isn't cheating, he or she could just not be paying attention, not taking it seriously. So I, I just kind of wanted to emphasize the reason why it bothers me when people give those ratings so much integrity, but please continue. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Um, so now as far as blitz goes, yeah, that's people did play speed chess, uh, but to play speed chess and actually just to play, you had to go to an over the board tournament. This is an 80s say, right? I mean, they did have uh, some online stuff in the 80s, which actually I played on, but not very few people are on it. It was very expensive because they charge you by the hour. Um, but for the most part, you know, if you wanted to play chess, you had to go play over the board. That's a huge difference. So now, you know, honestly, as I said, I don't play as much anymore because I can just play online. You know, I, I recognize the over the board experience is much better and much more significant. I think if I didn't have that outlet of playing, you know, online at just a common places like that, um, that I, then, you know, teaching or not, I'd have to go to your club or, or some club and start playing because, you know, obviously you want to play chess, you, you know, if you love the game. Um, but nowadays, I think, yeah, there is uh, a lot of people playing online. It's it's not as good as over the board, but if you don't have time or, or the dedication, you know, there's a lot of that. And of course, the big difference is, uh, you know, it's very hard online to, you know, get a serious game for the reason we just talked about. I like the two hour time control or, you know, whatever time control you're doing nowadays in the other clubs. Um, so you're, you're mostly playing blitz or, uh, you know, rapid or blitz. And um, that wasn't really much of a thing. I mean, definitely playing speed chess was a thing, even in the eighties and nineties, but you had to go to the club to do it, you know, or, or have a friend or something. Um, you know, you, there's no going online 24 seven, you know, you can get up at 3 AM, you know, you can't sleep and play some blitz. Then it was sort of more of a, a treasured thing. Oh, I'm going to get together with my friends or I'm going to go to Neil's club and, you know, afterwards we'll go play Blitz. And, you know, and, and they did a lot of it, you know, within the, those confines. But obviously it was very limited because you couldn't play it all the time. The other thing that's hugely different, which um, I've mentioned some other prior tests, is now you have score sheets. So I can actually look at my Blitz games. So for a long time in places like people like Bachfinnick and stuff, which they don't play blitz, it's bad for your chess. Even Fisher said it makes your chess superficial. Um, and there, there's some truth to that, I suppose. But everyone who's getting good, all the top players now, they play blitz all the time. And I think the reason is you have the score sheet. So now I could play blitz games. And even though they're likely, you know, worse than, you know, if I took more time, I still can look over the game, see where I went wrong in the opening, see the type of tactics I'm normally missing. Maybe, you know, using the computer, discover a strategy that I never, um, you know, considered in, in that structure, you know. So um, so now you could improve by playing Blitz and you can learn a lot about your chess. Um, so yeah, so Blitz is totally different because of the score sheets, because you could play all the time. And to some extent, it has affected the, the clubs and stuff because, um, you don't have to go there to do that. Um, 
at the same time, it has also helped the clubs, as you know, because I know Long Island Chess Club's thriving and, and a lot of the adult clubs, at the same time, this generated interest because now people who maybe wouldn't have gotten into chess, now they're playing online. It's a good introduction to chess, uh, like a gateway drug, I guess you could call it. And then, um, and then, yeah, you know, at some point, if you're playing a lot online and you're really serious about your chess and want to know how good you are, as we just discussed, you're going to have to play over the board. There's no way of really knowing over the, you know, until you play over the board. And you're also not going to get the respect. Let's say, theoretically, you, you know, you never played over the board and you got some humongous chess rating. Um, unfortunately, everyone's going to think you're just cheating, you, you know, and you got to prove it over the board because it, it's much harder and more uh, of a significant thing to uh, cheat over the board than, than online. So you're not, you're never going to have as much cheating you know, for a person to go for a room full of people who are going to be in the same room with him, watching him and cheat takes a lot more nerve than, you know, going home and, you know, being at home and switching on a computer or something. So, um, so over the board chess, because of all the reasons we just mentioned, it's always going to be more significant and, um, you know, and, and nicer that way. But the blitz, uh, yeah, now there's just so much of it. And, and the rapid chess, I remember when I got into chess, there was the argument like we were just talking about in some of the chess magazines, like that rapid chess is junk. They had a rapid chess world championship, uh, like in the eighties, like 88 or somewhere around there. They had the first rapid chess world championship. Uh, I think Castro didn't play as protest. Karpov won it. Um, and yeah, a lot of people said this isn't real chess and you know, you shouldn't do this. And now we're, we've come full circle and people are saying, Oh, forget about the old classical chess. We should just be playing rapid. So it is It is a big change there. I love what you said. There are two things I completely agree with. I like the way you phrased it, that online chess has now become a gateway to in-person chess. Because as I've said many times before, I was worried the opposite was going to happen with the yep. pandemic and the lockdown. Everybody was going to play online. That was going to be the, new, the uh, new normal, excuse me. But no, it's prompted people to play in person because they want the real deal. And... Mm -hmm. The other thing, as far as playing speed chess and blitz games online, I'm not against playing online because if, if you listen to me regularly on this pod, it might seem like I'm really anti. What I, I'm not, what I'm against is people who sort of just mindlessly play blitz without any analysis. Like the people who are going to get benefit from playing, let's say, like 5 0 games are the ones who are going to play, say, two or three blitz games and then they stop, they go back. They look at their games and analyze them. And like you said, the advantage of playing speed games online now is that you have the score sheet to review it. But the people who are just mindlessly playing like three minute games over and over and over till two in the morning, but not looking at their games at all. I don't know how much benefit you're going to get out of that, but that's what a lot of people end up doing because they either tilt or they lose and they want to get their rating points back. So instead of playing two or three games, analyzing them with the engine, seeing where you went wrong. They just keep playing more games over and over. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, no, if, you, if you're not going to look over the chess games, then, you know, as I say, that's why Botvinnik and people are very harsh about blitz chess before you have the game scores, because yeah, it is kind of a waste of time if you're not looking over the games, at least briefly with a computer, um, you know, not on your own, tearing apart the interesting positions. Uh, you know, the other thing, when I did those notes um, that I noticed that I thought was kind of weird, so when I first got into chess, uh, you know, female players uh, were, you know, supposedly much less than they are now, you know, less, less of them. And um, and it was a big thing, you know, the, but actually, um, and, and at the top level, they were much weaker. You know, um, the, of course, Polgar, when I was getting into chess, Polgar and um, Pia Cramley and some of the other players were coming up. But for the most part, the top women players were weaker, like in the U.S. championship you know, a lot of them weren't really that strong at all. Um, as I said, but on a local level, I just realized this. We had Carrie Goldstein, Phyllis Benjamin, and Tanya Kronich would come all the time to the chess clubs. Um, so we had like three female players generally at, at the adult club, at the over the board clubs uh, all the time. And I was just thinking nowadays, uh, you know, at your club, you know, and other local clubs, I can't think of really any female players who are coming all the time. So it's kind of funny. Women's chess has come a long way, and yet I don't know if, if what's happening in Long Island is typical of all the board clubs across the country or world, but it seems like there's uh, less women 
no. I mean, obviously, three people that I mentioned is a small sample side, but still, like, have you seen many women players at the Long Island Chess Club or? or well, yeah, un- right. I mean, yeah, unfortunately, there's not as many women and girls in the clubs as we would like. It seems to be, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not basing this, I'm just, this is like anecdotal evidence. I don't have any like scientific data. It seems at scholastic events, you're getting more girls now. Um, I'm not seeing, at, at least locally here, I can only speak around here. Unfortunately, you're not seeing too many adult women at the clubs. We, we've had a few, but it's, it's mostly, it's mostly male. Like I said, unfortunately, that's something that, you know, we all want to see improve. But it's interesting what you said, Brian, because I, I was there. I remember Carrie Goldstein, uh, some of the other names. I mean, I remember Phyllis Benjamin. Yes, that is Grandmaster Joel Benjamin's mother. Uh, she she played at Nassau a few times, right, back in the day? She would play all the time. Like, every week she'd be at Nassau playing. Right. So I, I remember I, I've, I've spoken to Phyllis a few times many, many years ago. She probably doesn't even remember me. But I, I remember having a few, like, passing conversations. And, yeah, it's it's interesting because having three female players at the club in, in the 80s, yeah, unfortunately that's more than uh, what I'm seeing now. You know, I guess it's just it's one of those things you just want to see improve. I I think at the continental chess type tournaments you might see more females. So maybe it could be. I know, um, you know, it must be tough. You know, you know, they they talk about this a lot. Uh, you know, being a female and playing where all males are. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they're reluctant to go over the board club. Um, you know, obviously I'm not a female, so it's hard for me to tell. But you know, at continental chess, it's much more. You know. I don't, I don't know you call you know it's not like a laid back over the board club so you can go there and just play and leave you know each round i mean i really don't know uh, it's uh as i say the fact that we had these three regulars in the 80s and 90s um you know it's a small sample size maybe maybe what's happening on long island isn't typical of what's happening in the world or the country but i know women's chess has come a long way and yet if for some reason it's not shown in, in over the board tournaments you know, the other thing I want to mention, last point, because I know we got to stop soon, is also following chess is so different. So when I first got into it, if you read the newspaper column, you know, if you read Soltis and Burns column, and then the articles in Chess Life, you're pretty much doing about all you can do in terms of following chess. You know, later on, maybe reading Inside Chess, New in Chess, uh, you know, Chess Chow. But for the most part, you know, if you read a chess magazine a month, you know, and, and keep up with the newspaper columns, you're good. You know, you've done just about all you can do. Nowadays, it's impossible to keep up with everything. Every Between the YouTube videos, the coverage of the online events, and, and a hundred other things, I don't care how dedicated you are, there's just too much going on, too much new material release. I remember when Kasparov came on David Letterman, it was like a huge thing just to watch him talk for five minutes on David Letterman. Now, you know, I could easily watch chess 24 hours a day and I wouldn't be able to keep up. So that's completely true. And I think that's also helped people improve. Um, there's just so much more digital content now or, or you know, uh, video content. So um, that, I would say, is a huge difference also between back then and now. Absolutely. Now, before I let you go, I want to end with this. Your Facebook group, and I'll link this up, your chess book collector's Facebook group. I heard you have something like 40,000 members now. Is that right? Something like that? So I think Chessbook Collectors has, I think, closer to 50,000, but I also have the C-Day uh, World Championship uh, 2023, and that has 97,000 members. That's a, 100,000 members. That's great. So I'm going to put links to both of those. So Brian Karen, my good friend, really appreciate it. Great conversation. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I enjoyed it. It's you. For those of you... At home, just a reminder, this is our Season 5 finale. I'll be back very soon with Season 6. I already have a few guests lined up, so stay tuned for that. I will post the date of our return on Twitter, on the main podcast description, and our website. If you're new to the chess angle, if you're just discovering us, this will be a great time to binge and catch up on what you missed. So maybe if you have a long commute to work every day, you now have something to do. We'll keep you company. And as always, really appreciate you listening, and I hope you win your next game. Have a great day, everybody.